Welcome back to the final part of my fascinating hour with author and astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. And Neil, let's on a cliffhanger, the 10 burning questions about the universe, rapid fires. Here we go. What was there before the beginning of the universe? Everyone asks this question. What's the simple answer? Oh, I, I, I'm delighted I can respond to you. We don't know. <laughs> but we got top people working on it. Okay. You know what? There may have been a multiverse. <laughs> I like that. I like the honesty. Well, saying, so we genuinely don't know. People I'm, just don't know, right? We don't know. There might have been a multiverse that's birthing universes and we're one of them. But that just pushes the question one step further before that. What was around before the multiverse? So we just don't know. It's, it's a frontier question right now. How will the universe end and what will there be afterwards? We have several ideas for how it will end. One, it'll just continue to expand forever as the temperature descends asymptotically towards absolute zero. And all phenomena and all processes will cease. All stars will burn out. They will shut off in the night sky one by one. And the universe will be cold and dark. But if the expansion of the universe, which is rapid and accelerating, is real and continues, That'll take us to the big rip, which we may have talked about on my we last did. visit. That terrifies me, because if the fabric of the universe stretches faster than the, con than the material substance can sustain it, then it, be it rips into the, ooh, I, oh. So I, that's, in 22 bil that's in 22 billion years. I know, so, that was the only comforting uh, part of, rather, that, of that conversation, was it takes 22 billion years I, to happen. I, right, will we in the next 100 yeah. years live on the moon or Mars or any other planet other than planet Earth, human beings? Uh, it's not that we can't do it, not that we couldn't figure out to do it. We'd have to ask, what is your motivation to do it? Do you realize Antarctica is wetter and balmier than every spot on Mars's surface, and you don't see people lining up to build condos in Antarctica. So I can see them as tourist destinations. I'll totally take a tour to, and have maybe the Moon Olympics. That'd be fun, <laughs> okay? And or a Moon Chefs, chefs uh, uh, shows. But, and and uh, the joke I always like telling, and it never gets old for me, is like the, the new cuisine on the Moon in restaurants would be great, it's just that they, they wouldn't have any atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliantly terrible, that joke. Um, is the universe yeah, inf yeah. infinite? And if not, what's on the other side of it? So the observable universe has a boundary. It's not a physical boundary. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a consequence of how fast it, light travels and how old the universe is. So that sets a horizon. A ship at sea, there's a horizon. Is, is, the, is the ship captain saying, is this all there is? Or does the ocean go on? And they know from their experience the ocean continues. We're pretty sure the universe goes well beyond our horizon. We don't know how far, and it's possibly infinite. And if it is infinite, then it wouldn't make sense to talk about an edge. No, then the second question becomes superfluous. Is time travel possible? We can definitely travel into the future by moving faster relative to everybody else. Um, and then you'll come back less aged than those you left here on I'll Earth. Rather like the, sound the tricky that. part, yeah, the tricky part comes if you wanna go into the past. And that's really dangerous. It is so dangerous that Hawking was thinking to himself that there must be some law of physics we have yet to discover that prevents it. Physically, it's called a time travel Conje uh, protection conjecture, all right? Where, because if you go back and prevent your parents from meeting each other, then you will never be born to go back in time to prevent your parents from meeting each other. And this whole thing with the Terminator movie, where he's killing everybody mm -hmm. who might give birth to, to the who's, person who's gonna overthrow the, the, the regime, all you have to do is prevent people from meeting each other or have them have sex 10 minutes later or earlier than they might have otherwise, and a different sperm would have fertilized the egg, and you got a different person. This whole shoot em up, it was so needlessly violent. Um, so yeah, it might not be likely that we can do this, but there are equations in the general relativity that allow it. We just, Hawking just wondered whether we'll come up to a boundary, a, a, a rule that says, nope, nope, the equation tells us, but a, a higher understanding of the universe might actually prevent it. Parallel universes, do they exist? 
all our current understanding of how this universe got here tells us there are plenty of other universes, and that's the multiverse idea. And parallel universe sounds a little more cool than just other universes in a multiverse, but sure, then there's likely an infinite number of them. Hence the possibility that I'm interviewing you on my show from London, and you're here in the, <laughs> you know, all combinations of all atoms and molecules and thoughts and neurosynaptic firings would exist in the infinite universes that are out there. You've actually suggested, I think you suggested you in the book, a, didn't you? You suggested that there could be a parallel universe where dreams are reality and realities are dreams. Yeah, yeah, or where stars are gazing down at you rather than you gazing up at the stars. <laughs> you could, there's a lot of variations in this, and some of these universes would have it slightly different laws of physics, so you don't want to visit them without full understanding of the consequences of that. You don't want to collapse into a pile of goo because the molecular forces that previously held your body together in this universe don't work in the other universe. That would be a dangerous, dangerous freeways to take. Okay. Um, Is there anyone else have... out there, Professor? Uh, anyone, you mean just life at all? Yes. Probably. We are made of the most common ingredients in the universe. Hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, iron. This stuff is everywhere in the universe. Life on Earth was opportunistic. It didn't take the rare ingredients and figure out what it could do. The most common ingredients. And life started at almost as quickly as it possibly could have. And we're just one planet out of eight. Get over it. Eight planets, one star among hundreds of billions in a galaxy among hundreds of billions, to suggest that we are alone in the universe would be inexcusably egocentric, <laughs> driven by some philosophy that is not grounded in observational science. <laughs> What's inside a black hole? Do you want to go find out? <laughs> <laughs> no. We, we think we know. What is the short answer, <laughs> no, do you we, think? We don't have... <laughs> okay, we don't, okay, so we have uh, equations tell us what's in a black hole, but we've never tested this, just so you know. So it tells us that within a black hole, the, a whole new space time can open up in the future history of this universe. And for, by that reasoning, we in this universe may be the other side of a black hole that lives in somebody else's universe. So that is perhaps the most intriguing part of the mm. equations that give us black holes. What's the most important thing that most of us don't know about the universe that we should? For me, it's the greatest gift that modern astrophysics has given civilization. In 1957, a research paper was published, including a leading female scientist, by the way, who's under-celebrated. Maybe one day we'll get a good biographer for her. Her name is Margaret Burbage. But anyway, they published a paper demonstrating that the, that the atoms in your body, the nitrogen, the iron, the carbon, that all of this are traceable to cosmic crucibles deep in the centers of stars. It, it, make, it manufactures them by thermonuclear fusion. The star explodes, scatters that enrichment into gas clouds that make the next generation of star systems, such as we. So it's not like you're out in the universe looking up and you say, yeah, I'm alive in this universe, but I feel small. No, the universe is alive within you and you should feel large. That revelation that we are not poetically, but literally stardust borders on the spiritual. And I think everyone, it is their duty to know that. To be honest, that I, is the I've ultimate been very well we aware that I am stardust for a long time, Professor, just to clarify. No. <laughs> <laughs> just don't sweep you into the dustbin. You know, we just, uh, the stardust final, you keep, my final, not throw away. My final quick fire question for you of the 10. Uh, what is your favorite fact about the universe? Of the unbelievably large number of facts you must have ascertained along with your scientist colleagues, what's the number one fact that you love most? I am astonished every day I wake up that the universe is knowable. Even on the small scales that we've, the, the nuts that we've cracked for it, that it's knowable at all that we are just, you know, billion-year-old carbon, as, as Joni Mitchell puts in her song, Woodstock. We can rise to consciousness and pose questions about our origin. It's been suggested that we are a way for the universe to know itself. 
But the fact that the universe is knowable at all, to me, is stupefying. Because who said it had to be that way? Mm -hmm. That we measure laws on earth and they are the same as they are in the heavens. It enables my profession in the first place. But I'll end with this thought, that as the area of our knowledge grows, so too does the perimeter of our ignorance. So this might be a never ending journey. So the more we know, the more stupid we get. Is that the bottom line? <laughs> I, I, I <laughs> <laughs> You gotta say it more poetically than that. Just, <laughs> you can't just put it out there like that. <laughs>